Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Art Cafe, Art and Architecture Conversations. Today is the 23rd of March and the topic is art and music. Now, before starting, let me remind you of my contact details. My name is Roberta. I'm the founder of Art Tours with a theme, Art Wit. And I am on social media. So please follow me and subscribe my YouTube channel. Uh, you can search for it, Art Tours with a theme. Uh, there's an Eventbrite page, of course, Art Cafe, if you want to follow this sort of conversations. And then you can follow my blogs on uh, interesting things to do in London, on Instagram, Art with underscore London, and Facebook, Art with London. So today, art and music, and I decided to start with a famous painting and a famous artist of 1900. So today we are not proceeding in chronological order, it's not a survey, but it's more by association of ideas. Why music is associated to art, uh, the possible meanings uh, in different times, in different periods, so relax, take a cup of coffee or a drink, and enjoy the presentation. Of course, if you have any questions or if you want to say anything, please use the chat area. Um, this is Vasily Kandinsky, who lived between 1866 and 1944. And this painting is called the Composition 8. It was made in 1923, oil on canvas. The dimensions are quite big. It's almost one meters and 40 by two meters. And you can see it at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Now, Kandinsky, the year before, had just started his collaboration with the famous Bauhaus School in Weimar in Germany which as you can remember, was an avant-garde art school that aimed at creating new artists for the new society that emerged from the ashes of the First World War. And the art that was taught there was very different from, let's say, the Académie Française, from the Royal Academy of Art in London, from the art school in Florence or Rome they aimed at creating a completely new alphabet, if you want, a new canon for the new society and the new values. In particular, um, Kandinsky in these sort of paintings investigates the correspondence between colors and forms and their uh, psychological and spiritual effect on the audience. So what you can see is something abstract, so we cannot recognize anything in real life, trees, people, houses, everything is very geometrical with this uh, very pastel color palette. And you can see uh, circles, you can see triangles, squares, lines, semicircles, and uh, in uh, some cases, you find um, those geometrical um, forms alone, like the circles. In some other cases, they overlap each other. And when they overlap, the colors also change. And in his research in Bauhaus, and even before that, uh, he th he, the, the desire he had is to offer a new uh, canon that found some in, in visual forms um, offered the experience that music uh, offers from um, a sonoric point of view. Um, he felt especially of those basic forms, the circle was somehow the most complete form, something that uh, is attracts us in, but also has a, forms, uh, has a force to push us out, to pull us out. So we are drawn in and we are pulled out. So you have um, the most complete of those forms. And in this sense, because it attracts and repels, it is a somehow pulsating in, out, in and out. And also look at the other forms that overlaps each other. 
they in overlapping um, somehow attract and repel. They, all, they somehow pulsate. And this idea was taken from um, a musician called uh, Arnold Schoenberg, who lived between 1874 and 1951. Actually, the two were friends. Schoenberg was um, an innovative musician, composer, was also a painter, was a writer, and he was very much associated to the artistic movement in Germany called Expressionism. So something that was avant-garde, that was not representative of reality as we see seen it, but reality as we perceive it. And perception is something that comes from the five senses, is not just the sight, but also your hearing. He introduced uh, an innovation called atonality, where it's very difficult to explain, but forget about uh, the composers of the past, such as Verdi, where you recognize a phrase that keeps on going on. Um, Schoenberg invented a new musical language in the same way as Kandinsky does. And he actually, Kandinsky wants to offer the same experience that Schoenberg offers from a musical point of view, but on canvas. How interesting. Clearly, this is the 1900, the 20th century, but it has not always been the same. So let's uh, explore how artists, visual artists, wanted to offer a visual experience of music. I'm going back 450 years before Kandinsky, and I am in the religious environment. This is a fantastic altarpiece called The Assumption of the Virgin by an artist, Italian artist in Siena, Matteo Di Giovanni, lived in high Renaissance between 1430 and 1495. So this was made probably in the second part of 1400 in the 70s, and it's a tempera on gold on wood. And this is not like canvas, it's wood, it's very heavy. It's, um, the weight is 150 kilograms and it's more than 300, uh, 300 centimeters high. So almost three, more than three meters by one meter and 74. You can uh, see it at the National Gallery in London. Now imagine the experience of entering in church, which at that time was en enlightened in uh, candles, uh, and seeing uh, this panel, a uh, golden maid, shining at the light of the candles with this huge Madonna that uh, is imagined uh, being invited into heaven and after her death, surrounded by a number of angels. Um, she, she's really a huge figure here, and the angels are much smaller. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, she's, she's sitting on something, but it's not a proper chair. The chair is made of um, angels uh, called the cherubims and seraphims in blue and pink, um, and they bring her up. Now, because this is um, uh, the, the reign of God, uh, the idea is to offer not just this fantastic visual experience, but somehow a perception of music, celestial music. This is, after all, the court of God mirroring the aristocratic courts in Italy where music was made. Um, and so you see the angels who make music, but look at them. They are in group of threes or four, and they each play different music, different instruments. So you have string uh, instrument, a wind instrument, a percussion instrument, they're all together. Wind, percussion, and wind, and string, and percussion, and wind. In reality, when we go to a concert, string instruments like violins are together, the percussions are together on another part of the orchestra. Um, and so different types of instruments are not mixed up. So why mixing them up in this painting? Because we are in heaven and celestial music is something 
we've never heard in theory on earth. So the idea that Matteo G. Giovanni wants to offer is that if in heaven there's a music that we human beings have never experienced in a way that instruments are mixed together. Now those angels are beautiful and they are color coded. Uh, you see the same color patterns repeating in different clothes. And um, there's a lot of symbolism because it's divine music. Um, they play the beauty of God. Um, it's a very lavish court, beautiful. Um, and we can maybe hear the music. Let's go on. And actually we jump uh, from 1400 uh, into 1610. It's still religious art, but this is an artist called uh, Carlo Saraceni, who was active in Venice between 1579 and 1620. He was a follower of Caravaggio. Caravaggio was the master of the so-called chiaroscuro, so the big contrast between a very dark background and points of very uh, striking light in the foreground. And here we have an important saint in Catholic religion, Santa Cecilia. Uh, Santa Cecilia is playing a string instrument and she's uh, listening to an angel uh, with his beautiful wings. Now, Carla Saraceni, yes, was a follower of Caravaggio, but he, he also innovated himself, bringing in additional elements of realism and details in the instruments, in the wings of this beautiful angel. And let's look at the instruments here. A bass, perhaps a trumpet, the, the book with a um, pentagram, a lute, perhaps a harp and a violin. Again, different instruments, um, you cannot play them together. So very probably Santa Cecilia is in, uh, on, in heaven. Now she was a Roman noble woman uh, that converted herself uh, into Christianity between the second and the third sequel. So before uh, Christianity, was made official and therefore she was killed, became a martyr. And she's the patroness of music, of musicians, of the music instruments makers, of, single, of singers, and she's very popular in Italy. In fact, in Rome, there are two important uh, musical institutions, the Accademia of Santa Cecilia, the Academy, which is one of the oldest musical institution in the world, opened in 1585. And the Basilica of Santa Cecilia, the church dedicated to the saint in Trastevere, uh, which was uh, really uh, opened a lot of time ago in the first phase of Christianity, where maybe Santa Cecilia had her home. And interestingly enough, about 200 years ago, at the end of the 18th century, a, a movement of scholars or musicians started a new religious music um, style that is in fact called Cecilianism, isn't it beautiful? I love this painting, but I love actually the wings of this angel. But is he an angel or is he a swan? Uh, the, the wings really look like the ones of a swan, given the realism of their plumage. And a swan is also an animal associated to music. Let's go to the next painting. This is what is called an allegory of music, a painting by Filippo Lippi, active in Florence, again in Renaissance, between 1406 and 1469, a temperon panel, it's quite small, 61 by 51 centimeters, which you can see in Berlin. Um, an allegory is a personification of a concept, an idea, in this case, music. And since antiquity, since Greek art, uh, music was also represented as a young woman, but in different ways. In this case, she is paired with a swan. 
And she's, instead of walking the dog, we say she's walking the swan with a beautiful ribbon. Her clothing uh, flies, so you have this flying drapery, which is a tribute to antiquity, to um, old bas reliefs in Greece. And she's also associated to two little angels, which are not angels, they are cherubs, not even that, they are putti. So they are a sort of non-religious angels, if you want. And she's also paired with um, instruments that here we can recognize as sort of flutes. And here there's a strange animal, a head, but it's a lyre. A lyre is a string instrument that is played with your hands or maybe with a tool, a device. Here it can be played with a little bone. And a deer or a stag is an animal that has a very fine hearing capability. So it's also an animal associated to music. So it's a, it's a fantastical object. And everything here reminds of Greek mythology. So this uh, beautiful lady that represents music uh, may also represent a muse, the muse Erato, which is the symbol of poetry, in particular lyric poetry. So when you have a song with words, uh, sometimes these words are made of a poem, a lyrical poem. The swan can perhaps represent the god Apollo, which is, who is the god of music, of dance, of sun. And both of them are actually, in Greek mythology, uh, brother and sister. They are both um, sons and daughter of Zeus, the big god of gods. Uh, and they all sit in this Arcadia region of Greece. Now, can you see the swan has his mouth open? There is a legend that says that a swan sings before dying, but maybe uh, it's not that. Maybe one of these two puttos is uh, Zephyrus, the god of wind. And there's also the legend that swans sing when there's a very light western wind. So who knows exactly what's the story, but it's beautiful to say that um, a swan is associated to music. I'm going on with allegories because allegories have been going on uh, for sequels still up to 1900. And here we have two examples of two different periods. On one side, this allegory of music is by a French artist called Laurent de la Hire, who lived in Paris between 1606 and 1656, a period that we define as Baroque. This is um, a fantastic painting of one meter five by one meter 44, which you can see in New York at the Met Museum. The instruments are um, and not something we are not very familiar with, a, a kind of lute called theorbo, this huge long instrument. She's tuning the theorbo, she's rehearsing and tuning. And there's, there are flutes, there's an organ, she's probably singing, and there's a bird perching on her, um, on the back of her chair, singing too. So you come together, this beautiful harmonious ensemble. But it's also very geometrical in a neoclassical style because you have those vertical columns. So we are within an ideal Greek temple, a Greek column, vertical uh, structural element with vertical decoration, a, a, a tree trunk and the pipes of an organ. Everything goes vertical with this uh, diagonal made by the instrument. I find it really beautiful. So it's a tribute to antiquity. Uh, next to it, about 80 years later, another allegory of music uh, in France, again, by another artist called Francois Boucher, lived between 1703 and 1770. Now, this is very dark with very bright colors, a proper Baroque style. And this Baroque style later on declined, transformed itself, it became less dramatic, more joyful, more playful. The colors are pastel-like. The forms are more, more less dramatic, more round. For example, I like this round shape of the cloud 
and this round shape of the elbow. It's a style called Rococo or Rococo um, that celebrates um, the happy times of Versailles, to say. Um, this is something of 1774, which you can see at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and it measures more or less the same, one meter by one meter 30. So you can see the instruments that we recognize. It's a lyre played by a putto, a flute, a trumpet, the book, but nobody really is playing. And in both cases, what captures my attention that both women are half naked. And the idea was for the patrons who commissioned those art to have half naked women at home without shame. And at the same time, demonstrating their erudition, their culture, their knowledge of the past. I don't know if I would hang these paintings in my place, but I really like them. This idea of allegory of music, it didn't stop with Baroque, it went on. And this is a fantastic painting by Gustav Klimt. It's called Music One. Klimt uh, was a Viennese artist who lived between 1862 and 1918. He sadly passed away during the Spanish flu. And this painting is from the, eight or the end of 1800, 1895. It's quite big, uh, but not huge. So you get uh, one meters and 100 by 90 centimeters and can be seen at the Neue Pinakothek in Germany. Now, uh, Klimt was uh, one of the uh, founders of a movement called the Austrian Secession. So the secession, the separation from the past, they, those artists want to introduce art that was completely different from the past, of course, you can tell. But it had also a political stance. They wanted to propose um, a return to nature, a return to simple values, a return to antiquity, uh, inspired by antiquity such as Egypt. In fact, we can see a sphinx and Greek uh, topics because they felt the Austrian empire was too aggressive and uh, it was in this imperialistic approach to uh, other countries, um, forgot about the true nature of, of people. So this is an opposition between also industrialization and nature. The so-called Art Nouveau celebrates all things floral, as opposed to all two things industrial in modern cities at the end of 1800. I like how this once for once a completely dressed and well-dressed woman is placed to the side of the painting. I like there is lack of symmetry here. It's very modern. And uh, I like the colors. I like she's really intent in playing rather than tickling around. And here music is a symbol, is a music, uh, is a symbol of artistic freedom. And uh, also uh, these artists, the symbolists, the Art Nouveau, the Secession, used a Greek goddess called the Pallas Athena as their emblem, as their patron, because she represents wisdom and arts. The patron who commissioned this painting was also Greek, based in Vienna. He was a tycoon, a very rich Greek um, entrepreneur. His name was Dumba or Damba. And he had a huge palace in Vienna with the, the music room. And so this painting was meant to be for his music room, perhaps one of the entry doors. Um, beautiful, really. OK, so allegory of music. Interestingly enough, a number of uh, artists portrayed themselves, so did self-portraits or portraits of other people using music as an allegory. So although it's not this painting called a self-portrait as a lute player by superstar of Baroque, Artemisia Gentileschi, um, although it's a self-portrait, as I said, it is still somehow a tribute to the muse of music and to the allegory. This was made in the year 1615-17. Here Artemisia is 20, in her 20s. She lives in Florence. 
and she needs to make a name for herself. She needs to advertise herself. And so what she do, she does a, a number of self-portraits in different ways, in this case with a lute, demonstrating that she's an erudite um, artist that she, and that she's highly intellectual. She's not just a craft maker, but she's able to elaborate multiple disciplines. And actually, art historians said that by the details of this lute and by the way she handles it and plays it, it means she was an accomplished musician. She actually was a self-taught musician and she could read and write. She was a self-taught literate. Can you believe it? Here she represents herself as a gitan, we say, as a gypsy. Um, with her beautiful scarf and low neck um, shirt. And it was the fashion of gypsies who uh, moved court to court performing their music. So she might have seen them at the court of Medici in Florence. In fact, this was in, um, either commissioned or was eventually bought by the Medici Florence. In fact, it appears in an inventory in, in, the, in the Medici Villa in 1638. Then it disappears and suddenly comes out to light in a Sotheby's auction in 1998. And she's, it is then bought by the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Connecticut where we can see it. Um, so she's represented the good society. She is, she wants to say, I'm part of the good society. I can be a good court painter and a member of the good society at court. The style is again Caravaggesque, this big uh, shadows, this big contrast. But contrary to Caravaggio, I have noticed in many other paintings as well, that she turns towards the shadow. Whereas Caravaggio typically paints her heroines towards the light. Very interesting. Again, the good society. Now we jump in 1700. This is England. And this is a painting by the famous Thomas Gainsborough, who lived between 1727 and 1788. He is one of the two founders of the famous Royal Academy of Arts in London in 1768. And uh, uh, this is a portrait of one of the two uh, daughters of his. Her name is Margaret. And she's um, actually um, playing, uh, it says a theorbo that we have seen earlier. I wrote here a lute because this is an unfinished painting. And so it's not exactly clear what she's playing, but a string um, instrument of those days. This was made 1777. It's quite small. You can see it. It's uh, currently hung at the National Gallery, 90 centimeters by about 70. Now, Margaret and Mary, the other sister, were accomplished musicians and the family, mm, uh, Thomas Gainsborough, his wife, and the two daughters used to play together a lot. This was a way to, to be together. So here music is a family thing. It allows to display their affection by doing something together. However, Thomas Gainsborough was also adamant for his daughters not to have a public career as musicians, not to play for the public. Um, this would, was considered being a musician, perhaps not appropriate, not very decent. And so she has this melancholic look, doesn't she? I love her hairdo, this huge hair, the fashion of 1700. I love her ribbon, her attire. And she's probably, probably looking at somebody else in the family circle playing with her keeping the tempo, perhaps. But maybe she's a bit melancholic because she couldn't play at some concert hall. What a pity. But I like this painting because although it's unfinished, it tells a lot about how Thomas Gainsborough was working, his methodology. So what he did, he prepared the canvas before painting on top. So the canvas is primed, uh, so it's prepared with a color, reddish and brownish colors. Uh, 
This was a method of preparation of the canvas that uh, also uh, Van Dyck or, and Rubens had a uh, hundred years before. So this is a tribute that Gainsborough does to uh, his masters, let's say the masters of the past, and a continuation of the same technique. And on top of this primed canvas, he then sketched the outlines in thick, bold black paint. And this sort of methodology is quite clear in this um, not finished work. It's really beautiful. Now we jump back again in time um, in Italy. The, um, this is called, of course, a concert. What an imagination by an artist active in Ferrara, Lorenzo Costa, between 1460 and Mantua, 1535. So Ferrara and Mantua were um, very important courts. Of course, they were less important than Florence, but recent studies have reevaluated those minor courts in being extremely important in, um, in the cultural environment, maybe less political, but more cultural environment of Northern Italy. And it was quite common to have, we said, um, gypsies that were moving court to court, but these guys do not look like gypsies at all. Actually, maybe it's a portrait of the Bentivoglio family in Bologna, who uh, we have new record that they commissioned an altarpiece for the main church in Bologna, where this painting maybe was meant to be included to, in or maybe they are members of the Este family who were the rulers of Ferrara, extremely powerful, extremely elegant family. Or maybe it's just an allegro music as the ones we have seen before. Um, it's quite small if you go and see it, 95 by 75 centimeters, but it really stands out in the room at the National Gallery with this beautiful black background, no shadows, very black. And those three figures that really stand out, they look like a cutout from a different uh, painting, photoshopped almost. And they are very interesting because what you see here, a woman and two men, they, they play a lute. And there's another interesting instrument on this tabletop in front of them that is called a rebeck which is sort of little violin. And this stick, it's not a flute, but it's a recorder. And the genius idea of Lorenzo Costa, the painter, is to give a sense of perspective through the use and the position of this rebec, which is not parallel to the plane, but is perpendicular to this table. And it protrudes beyond its edge. So it captures our eyes and throws them towards the lute and the rest of the scene. So it expands the pictorial space in a very perspective way. It's very interesting. So this is not a chiaroscuro technique that Caravaggio would have used later, and we are going to see it, but the big contribute is dark and white is um, uh, very sharpened. And you see uh, a sfumatura, you don't see gradual, movement between uh, the darkness of the background and the lightness of the foreground. It's tuck. You, you jump from one to the other. These three um, people are singing, but their mouths are open in different ways. So they're singing different notes. And what they are, they are doing, they are singing from a book. This is the book with notes. And this was a new thing in that period. In Italian, it said cantare a libro, singing from a book, an innovation in music in Renaissance. And they sing a song called Frottola. Uh, looks like a pastry. It's actually, it was a very complicated song made in three parts for a tenor, soprano, and bass. And what they are doing with their hands is counting the time. And they're counting the time on the tabletop as well on the shoulder of the music player. Beautiful. Um, the lady is dressed in a simple way, but very elegant. The two guys, again, are very elegant, dressed in a simple way. So they are not musical performers. They are not professional musicians. They might have been uh, members of one of those families playing together. So we've seen the Gainsborough family playing together via the portrait of Margaret. 
Here you have a portrait of three members of the family playing together. It was for themselves. This is a new genre, a new kind of painting that Lorenzo Costa introduces in Italy in that period and is followed by other um, artists from that point onwards. Now let's talk about Caravaggio, the great genius of Baroque. Um, this is called the lute player. And uh, this is made more than 100 years after the concert we have just seen before. Now, again, you have a very dark background, very, very light person in the foreground, but this is called chiaroscuro because you still have a sense of shadows and there's a gradual movement of light from total darkness into some grayish area into white. So it's gradual, it's soft, it pleases the eye. Um, so what is this guy doing? Um, he's, of course, a lute player um, and uh, he's, he's a professional musician in this case. He's, he's dressed in simple clothing. And let's have a look at the instruments that are in his hands on, on this beautiful tabletop, this time covered by beautiful carpet. There's a lute, there's a violin, there's a keyboard. Uh, it's called the spinetta, a precursor of uh, piano, of course. And here, maybe you cannot see it, but there's a caged bird who sings together with him. Like we saw before, the allegory of music uh, by the French uh, Baroque painter, the bird and the lady you have the bird and a man. He's singing a madrigal, a traditional song from this period. Uh, madrigals were love songs. And this um, pentagram has been deciphered and has a, a, a poem. The, the words are, are from a poem of the Italian poet Francesco Petrarca, who is a giant in Italian literature of this period and of all periods. So this is a tribute to Italian art, if you want. This uh, guy, usually in um, those sort of concerts, uh, were used uh, castrati, those young boys, the poor things that were prevented surgically from becoming uh, adolescents and men. And their voice kept on being the voice of an angel, the white voice. But more recent reconstructions attributed this uh, person to actually, guess what? The lover and boyfriend of Caravaggio, uh, whose name was uh, Minniti. His name was, let me check, Mario Minniti. And he's represented in many paintings. Now, this artwork one meter by one meter 25, uh, 26 can be seen at the Wildestein collection in New York. And it has been there for quite some time. This painting, this version was made a few years later in 1600. This time it's called again, the lute player, but it's in St. Petersburg in Russia. And uh, there are new things. You see a vase, uh, with a bouquet of flowers, there's fruit, there's no carpet, it's the bare marble. And this is something that Caravaggio does to pay tribute to Northern European still life that we have covered a few days ago in another talk I made uh, on women artists in Baroque. Uh, look at the bravura in showing the reflections of light and that both fruit and, and, and uh, flowers have symbolic meanings uh, connected to moral values. This time, the music is not a words of Italian, the Italian Petrarca, but on a French poet whose name is Jacques Arcadel. And the reason for this change is that the patron who commissioned this painting, a cardinal del, uh, from Rome called Del Monte, was actually pro-France. Yes, uh, the papacy was a nation, was a state. The Pope and cardinals were not only in religion, but were political people. Um, they were head of states. And so uh, Del Monte had a court like um, Este at Ferrara, like Medici in Florence. And in this erudite, very intellectual court, there were talks about art, there were talks about music. And so he wanted to recreate those sort of erudite, uh, conversations. 
Now, in 2007, the third version of this painting was found in the UK, Badminton House in Gloucestershire, slightly different dimensions, 96 by 121 centimeters. The title this time is Apollo, the lute player. Again, Apollo, the god of music, the god of sun, comes in. And uh, no differences in terms of lute, violent, the composition, but this painting looks like the most accomplished of the three. Now, regardless, uh, regardless, you, you see all three together, uh, the topic is the same, the instruments are the same. Uh, there isn't something right in the eyes of the first uh, sitter here, uh, the third, which was the second I showed that in chronological order, the one discovered in 2007, which was made in the same year as the first one, looks like the best of the three. Um, can we hear music here? Uh, I'm not sure, but for sure, it's beautiful to the eyes. Now, Cardinal Del Monte also commissioned this concert, Concerto or in Musici, the Musicians to Caravaggio in 1597, so more or less the same years, something that you can see at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The dimensions are about the same, 88 centimeters by 116, more or less. But here you have a group of musicians who rehearse before a concert. And uh, beautiful, you, get, you have again, perhaps the lover of Caravaggio here in the center. And this boy is perhaps Caravaggio himself in a self-portrait when he was young. Look how innovative is the position of the third um, musical uh, musician giving us his back and like singing to himself the notes. There's also some uh, innovation in this angel that looks like completely detached, part of the gang, but not really rehearsing, is completely naked. And these sort of wings remind us of an angel, the, a swan, as we saw before, or perhaps Icarus. There was part of the discussion, uh, erudite discussions in those courts. Icarus, as you can remember, uh, dead, flying with his fake wings, uh, in the sky and he went so close to the sun and he burned himself and died. So that's perhaps a symbol. Now this angel or swan or Icarus keeps in his hands grapes. And this is a tribute again to still life of the golden Dutch period. But grapes have also a symbol and they represent the body of Christ. But at the same time, they act uh, as a warning against the risk of debauchery. In fact, those boys, yes, they're musicians, but mm, maybe there's more. Maybe there is homosexuality going on uh, in this painting, which is actually considered very erotic by art critics today. So what was happening there? Um, so Caravaggio may pay tribute to this sort of love, who knows? Uh, but um, it's important the music and those parties at the courts are done properly within the limits of decency. Now we are, in terms of decency and symbols, let's have a look at still life. What Caravaggio was thinking of when he made his tributes to symbols with fruit and flowers and so on. Still life was a genre that was uh, in practically uh, invented in, in the Netherlands in 1600 and became so popular that was exported everywhere in Europe to the point that this artist Edvard the Collier changed his name and Britishized it, anglicized it into Edward Collier to be more uh, marketable. He lived between 1662 and 1708. And these sort of paintings of his are called vanitas, like all the still life paintings. Now you see beautiful instruments, but you see also beautiful objects that relate to the wealth of the patron. You see a poem, um, and music, again, this poem relates to the um, fragility of life. Glass refers to the fragility of life. There's a skull that means memento mori, remember you must die. 
and there's a poem in Latin that is also around this vanity, this vanitas. So here instruments are used to remember us that we have to die. Oh, what a sad thing. This is, belongs to Tate. Another genre that the Dutch invented was the so-called Merry Company. It was like having paintings at home that could bring you some happiness. People playing together, having good time. But in this case, you have Hendrik Ter Bruggen uh, in 1626 that has as well a Caravaggesque approach. In fact, he was part of a group of artists in Utrecht who imported the style of Caravaggio in Holland, but they also innovated. In fact, he adds his own mark on it with his own ideas. There's still grapes here. Remember, this is the blood of Christ but also music can be very dangerous. Remember that you, have ha you need to have decent parties. There was a hierarchy in music. Voice came first, then um, uh, string instruments, and then flute. But because they are sitting in a circle, it looks like those hierarchies are cancelled for once and just having good company. Um, this is another painting along the same lines by Ian Mienz and Molaner, uh, three years later. They are both at the National Gallery. This artist was the husband of the famous woman artist uh, Judith Lester, who was extremely popular uh, in her lifetime, but then got forgotten after her death, to the point that the number of paintings made by her were erroneously attributed to her husband. Now, in this case, uh, it, there are no doubts that it's made by her husband, so let's credit him, two boys and a girl making music. Now, this is a merry company of ones, three children having fun. What I like is the little girl that is making, mu with, making music with a found object, um, a metal helmet found somewhere, uh, left by a soldier, and she's also wearing part of the armor. <laughs> That's very sweet. And this boy is making music with improvised instrument. In the Netherlands, this symbolism around music was very used. And the first painting by, again, the same artist, Ian Mienz and Molenar, shows a couple, a young man playing a theorbo, uh, remember the instrument we saw before, and a young woman making music. They are just wet at home, uh, but they perhaps not slept together. Um, why is it important? I don't know, this is the symbols, or maybe they're not married because this heater and she's without a shoe uh, means uh, erotic love, a marital love, but this uh, coffee, mug, coffee uh, cup that is closed means that this marriage has not been consumed. So there are a lot of symbols going on, uh, but music brings harmony, harmony to the couple. But there's a fine line between decency and debauchery. And this is a painting set in a brothel. Can you believe it? Having at home a brothel. Um, so brothel scenes were a subset of Mary Company's uh, scenes. And here, of course, these people have... Um, surpassed the decency line and you have the procuress, the client and the prostitute, and she's making music. This painting that is in Boston, this is a National Gallery, this, the one made in Boston became so famous that um, 80 years later, Johannes Vermeer decided to use it in his own painting here, called A Young Woman Seated at a Virginal. Now, to me, this lady looks like a schoolgirl, but she was not. She was actually a prostitute waiting for her clients. This was made in 1670. It's quite small, 15 cent 50 centimeter by 45 at the National Gallery. And it's very interesting, this cross-contamination of uh, genres and paintings between different artists. And Johannes Vermeer arrives to the point that he paints this, perhaps the same girl in two different um, positions. Here she's a prostitute. The painting is here of Dick van Bourbon. And this one, she plays, but there's an empty chair and there's a cupid on the wall, symbol of uh, marital love, 
and she should wait just for one man and not many. So again, music, symbol, moral values. But if you really want to have fun, you need to go to France uh, in 1635 and join Nicolas Poussin and his triumph of pun. Uh, now, Poussin was famous for being very serious, a bit boring, but in, in the, the part of his um, production, it is that very joyful and very fun. And in this pain, uh, painting, where uh, there's no doubt on what these people are doing, having an orgy, where uh, there's a lot of food and wine and music with a tambourine and a trumpet, uh, they are paying tribute to the god Pan. Pan was a Greek god of abundance, and apparently in Roman times, uh, Romans had uh, those big parties that perhaps ended up in orgies to um, pay tribute to the god and have an abundant crop. But here music is really at the periphery of the party. It entertains, but nobody cares, it seems so. Again, nobody cares about music uh, in this uh, Tuileries Gardens by Manet in 1862 and along canvas at the National Gallery, one meter and 18 by 76 meters. Here, you cannot see musicians, although music is in the title. You perceive the buzz, the chats, the gossips, the little talk. You perceive the movement, you perceive perhaps the textile of the clothing movement, some air in the, in the trees, but no music. So music here perhaps entertains somewhere, but nobody cares. But music is important because music helps those people evading the chaos, the stress of the modern Paris. We are again in modern Paris. Manet now represents an, an indoors environment, the Café Chantin, the Café Concert, a place where the new social classes could enjoy music and theater shoulders to shoulders with upper classes. So that's in the modern times. Nothing happens. It's all about having fun, being in yourself, being in your thoughts, and enjoying the rush, the movement, the chaos, and the fun. Now, this conversation cannot complete, cannot be complete if I don't share few portraits of musicians. For example, this Ritratto di Musico, so a portrait of an unknown musician by Leonardo made in 1490 is perhaps unfinished, but is one of the most uh, or the best preserved portraits by Leonardo who innovates uh, in the position of the sitter, innovation the topic. There are no instruments, but there's here a, a music book, a music paper where those notes are recognized as being a cantum angelicum, something for religion purposes. Apparently, Leonardo was also a composer, but it's not his music. Um, so this is a portrait of somebody else. And I paired it and contrasted it with a portrait perhaps of Vivaldi by an unknown artist is 300 years later, where the portrait is made a completely different way. I love his wig, among other things. It's more uh, an allegory of music, isn't it? Where Leonardo is more real thing. This is a, a, a compare and contrast of two portraits of two sopranos by two women artists. One, Angelica Kaufman, who lived in 1700. Um, and you can see this painting in Princeton University. And this is the portrait of the famous Sarah Harrop, who was um, an important soprano of those dates. But she's represented again as an allegory of music, as a muse. Instead, the other woman artist in France, Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun in Paris, represents the Italian Angelica Catalani singing in, uh, in a real life uh, environment. And I love her dress. We call it empire style. Really beautiful. And to end up, I'll close up again. We started with Kandinsky. I finished with Piet Mondrian. Um, who celebrates the modern life in the cities, in the urban context, as if he was a bird. So imagine you're flying and you look down New York 
you see the grids of the cities. And usually Mondrian represents the city is straight line. Here they are dotted, they are with little squares. This is called Broadway Boogie Woogie. I love the title. Boogie Woogie has a, a rhythm, has a tempo. And so these sort of squares represent the tempo of the Boogie Woogie, as well as the colors, the yellow color represents the New York taxis. And so you have movements of cars, movements of people and dancing. So let's go to MoMA and enjoy Boogie Woogie. Time flew by, so thank you very much for listening to this talk. Um, I want simply just to share what's next. Of course, we are going on with the monthly art cafe in the next month, with the exception of April due to Easter holidays. I'll have, I want, I hope you can join me online for my art history mini courses. On the 30th of March, I'm going to cover women artists in 1700 enlightenment, like Angelica Kaufman that we've seen before. And at the end of April, we talk about Leonardo again, drawing the mind from Leonardo to the present time with a guest speaker, multimedia artist, Maria Teresa Ortoleva, who is based in London, although she's Italian, and she uses drawing and installations to repropose the thinking of Leonardo and his um, and other masters and his followers. Now, if you are in London, please join me for two tours at this coming Saturday, women artists in Soho and St. James's. And at the end of April, uh, we are going to Shoreditch, um, where we are going to see a couple of photography exhibitions. And there's a chance, because there's a lot of street art, to take photos ourselves. So we'll do a little bit of practice in street photography. Now, before leaving this talk, uh, please, please subscribe my YouTube channel, um, Art Tours with the theme Art Wit. You can find the links in my socials.